Okay, do we have the slide show up? Yes? Anyone? Yeah, it's on. Okay, great, thanks. All right, uh, ILM 310-304-CC, Gas Analyzers Part C. Um, this one is short and sweet, um, talking about uh, combustion exclusively in this part of this particular ILM. So our objectives today are describe combustion parameters that we measure to determine the air fuel ratio. And then we are going to look at uh, outlining the relationship between energy conservation, pollution emissions, and combustion efficiency. So um, this really, this ILM speaks to kind of a spin-off of our trade that's kind of occurring right now, and that's combustion uh, combustion control and combustion efficiency monitoring. Lots of organizations are now focusing on uh, ensuring that all their uh, fuel burning devices, furnaces, line heaters, boilers, and things like that are uh, operating as efficiently as they can. Of course, uh, putting out as few pollution CO2 is a hot one right now. Um, so this ILM speaks to the considerations that are involved with these different uh, combustion uh, processes. Okay, quick look at combustion uh, in a big picture here, kind of cap encapsulating what we're going to be looking at today. Um, starting out looking at the combination between um, oxygen and some type of a hydrocarbon. Um, we tend to keep it simple here and start out with methane, which is the uh, simplest hydrocarbon that we generally will talk about. Uh, and when we combine oxygen and a fuel and provide it with some kind of uh, form of ignition, uh, in a perfect world, it'll burn and give off carbon dioxide, heat, and water as its products. Again, in a perfect world, if everything is going properly, this is these are the products that we get. Uh, we'll address what happens if we have uh, too little oxygen or too much oxygen and how that affects our products. And that's kind of what we're going to be looking at uh, today. So uh, some terms to uh, clear out here before we get going. Combustion efficiency, uh, by definition, is the effectiveness of the chemical reaction to convert as much internal energy contained in a fuel as possible to heat energy. So we're trying to get the most bang for our buck out of the fuel that we're providing. Air fuel ratio is the measure that we use uh, when we're talking about uh, combustion efficiency. Um, it's a, it, it is, as it sounds, the ratio of air to fuel present during combustion. And the idea is when all the fuel is combined with all the free oxygen, uh, it's chemically balanced. And this air fuel ratio is called the stoichiometric, uh, the stoichiometric mixture. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, stoichiometric mixtures. Um, for this, uh, this statement here is uh, comes with a caveat. Chemically uh, and mathematically, um, when we do our balancing, you know, we match our carbons and our hydrogens and our oxygens from side to side in the formula. Uh, that's what we're talking about here when we're talking about a stoichiometric mixture. But we are going to point out, you will uh, see here um, in the last point, a stoichiometric mixture will produce carbon monoxide uh, with the combustion of hydrocarbons. And although mathematically on paper we can do a reaction formula that will show us our proper air fuel ratio, the reality of it is if we use that proper air fuel ratio, it's not going to work uh, like the textbook says it is. It's going to produce carbon monoxide instead of carbon dioxide. And the main reason for that is that not all of the um, oxygen and, and fuel are going to mix together properly uh, and burn. And, to address that, and really the key points about this whole ILM, uh, the key point there is that we always strive to have more oxygen uh, in our combustion mixture so that we always end up with CO2. Uh, you'll, see, you'll know that CO is, is quite bad. Uh, CO2 is also not fantastic, but it's the best that we can get out of hydrocarbon combustion. So the idea here is even though theoretically, if we do our math and we do some chemistry, uh, and we do a balanced equation that tells us that this is the magic formula, but in reality, because not all the oxygen can find uh, hydrogen and carbon to, to bond within the reaction, that we get in incomplete 
uh, combustion. So we strive for extra oxygen so that we make sure that all the fuel finds oxygen and burns. Uh, as a result of this criteria here, we uh, have guidelines uh, which tell us that we are looking for 1% excess oxygen and we want to be lower than 200 ppm of carbon monoxide as our target value. So as we move forward, um, these are kind of industry standards uh, in terms of combustion efficiency uh, and pollution control that, that we're worried about measuring. So these are kind of the golden ticket as far as what values we're striving for. So let's look at what that looks like uh, in, a, in a complete combustion and incomplete combustion uh, chemical reaction formula. So here we have the combination of CH4, which is methane, with oxygen uh, in a ratio of two parts oxygen to one part methane. And when we have that reaction and we do our, we do our math and we do our balancing, uh, we end up with CO2 and H2O as our reactants. And this is what we call a stoichiometric uh, equation because everything is balanced here. I have one carbon on this side, one carbon on this side, four hydrogens here, four hydrogens here, four oxygens there, two here and two here. So everything balances. Um, and theoretically, that's called complete combustion. Uh, the reason we know that it's com complete combustion can be identified by the fact that our products are CO2 and H2O. If it's anything other than this, there's a problem. So to see what that looks like here, uh, here now I have uh, two parts of methane and three parts of oxygen. And if we uh, have this combustion reaction occur, the products are going to be carbon monoxide and water. Um, the difference between the first equation and the second equation is the uh, is the ratio of the fuel to the oxygen. Up here it's two to one. Down here, if we bring this down to lowest common denominators, it's one and a half to one, uh, one and a half parts of oxygen to one part of fuel. And we see that by taking away a little bit of that oxygen, we end up with toxic carbon monoxide uh, as a product in the exhaust. And we also end up uh, with heat loss because uh, we should be burning we should be burning all that CO. Uh, CO and hydrogen are both uh, combustible by themselves and um, we'll talk about the consequences of having carbon monoxide and hydrogen going up the stack uh, being that they are flammable so uh, I'm sure you can probably guess what that might lead to. Okay so air fuel calculations are how we um, determine how much air and fuel that we're going to need. Uh, using the previous example for methane, we saw that it took two moles of oxygen to react with one mole of fuel uh, in order to get carbon dioxide and water as our products. Um, we're going to take a little twist here because the reality of life is, is that we are not going to run uh, a furnace on pure oxygen um, for a number of different reasons. Uh, first of all, you'd have to have giant tanker trucks of oxygen uh, connected to your uh, heat machine. Uh, and that's not very practical. And oxygen by itself is very, uh, very dangerous. And you probably wouldn't park something like that next to a furnace. So what we have to do is get our oxygen from somewhere else. And where is that place where we get our oxygen? And I mean, literally, where do we get our oxygen? And that's from air. So um, if theoretically, or actually, if we're looking at the previous slide here, this is actually a oxygen to fuel ratio rather than an air to fuel ratio. So now we're going to make that jump between uh, oxygen uh, as a pure gas into oxygen that we drive from air. Uh, and I think we've touched on this in a previous lecture, um, but this will be a little bit of a, a review. So one mole of oxygen, the gas, is of course 100% oxygen. One mole of air, however, uh, is only 21% oxygen. We know that air is made up of 70. 8% nitrogen and 21% oxygen and some other stuff. So uh, if we're using air because it's only got 21% oxygen compared to the 100% that we're using mathematically, we have to we have to modify our formula in order to get more oxygen out of uh, out of air. So uh, the way we do that is we take our 100% oxygen value divided by the 21% oxygen that's available in air. And we do the division there, and it tells us that we would need 4.6 parts of air, or 4.6 times 21, in order to get the same amount to equal 100% pure oxygen. So this is the conversion that we use to 
um, to get from oxygen to oxygen in air. Okay, so in this case here, uh, we're going to need uh, two, two parts of oxygen or, or air. So in order to change two parts of oxygen into two parts of air, we got to do two times 4.76 or 9.52 to one. So this is the difference between an oxygen fuel ratio, uh, which in the previous example we saw was 2.1, but we need to get air because that's what we have available. So in order to make that same uh, ratio apply and get complete combustion, we're going to need 9.52 parts of air for every part of, of methane. And this will change uh, depending on the fuel that we're using, but for methane, it's 9.52 parts to one. So the importance of excess air, uh, we kind of touched on it uh, a little bit here. If we use the stoichiometric amount of air, we would end up with CO in the stack. And the reason behind that is because the air and fuel do not mix perfectly at the burner. If we add excess air, that allows us to promote better mixing and a cleaner stack gas. So as a result, we strive for 1% excess air or to round it off 5% uh, air, 1% oxygen, sorry, or 5% air. And this is just rounding up that 4.76 uh, number. So these are a couple of important numbers uh, as well. So how do we know if we have enough air or not enough air? Well, we have all kinds of wonderful calculations. The first one we're going to look at here is called the excess air calculation. Uh, and it's not a tricky calculation. Uh, question says, calculate the percent of excess air for methane when the air fuel ratio is 14.28 to 1. Uh, the air fuel ratio for methane, as we saw earlier, is 9.52 to 1 in a, in a calculated uh, formula. But again, remember, we're, we're striving for um, more. So let's do a calculation and see um, how, how much extra air we have here is essentially what we're doing. So to do that, we use this formula, uh, percent of excess air, which is the actual air fuel ratio, in this case, 14.28, minus the theoretical air fuel ratio, which we calculated at 9.52, uh, divided by the theoretical air uh, fuel ratio. So pretty straightforward math, my, uh, 14 minus 9 over 9 times 100 uh, tells us that in this particular situation, using this air fuel ratio, we have 50% excess air, which is far too much uh, excess air. Uh, and you might say, well, I thought we needed excess air. We do, uh, but just enough to, to make that mixing to get complete combustion. If we put too much up there, uh, essentially what it does is it carries away the heat that we create up the stack um, and, and uh, doesn't allow the heating value from our fuel to, to soak into the system that we're, we're trying to use, whether we're generating steam or doing line heating or whatever it happens to be. But that extra gas just carries the heat up the stack uh, and we don't get to use it for what we're planning on using it. So we've added extra air to the mix. Uh, what does that achieve for us? First of all, it provides us with complete combustion, meaning that we don't have carbon dioxide or sorry, carbon monoxide uh, as a product in our, in our stack. Second, uh, we end up with some increased oxygen in our stack. And again, we want a little bit, but we don't want a whole bunch. We don't want a whole bunch more. Uh, we also end up with increased nitrogen in the stack, and we'll talk in a, in a little bit about uh, the effects of some of these other gases that we don't really consider um, going up the stack. So we measure oxygen in the stack uh, with the zirconium oxide sensor, if you recall from earlier. Uh, we want some excess, not too much. Remember, about 1% uh, of excess uh, oxygen, about 5% air. This tells us that our ratio is good. If there's not enough, excuse me, we're going to end up with seal. Pretty much straightforward. Okay. Um, not only do we end up with carbon monoxide, which we have talked about pretty much exclusively so far, we also end up with hydrogen gas. Uh, and those of you who have been working in the field uh, should know uh, that hydrogen gas is also extremely flammable. Um, and that's not a good thing to have going up our stack uh, easy or e either. Uh, these gases are flammable and measurements of more than 300 ppm uh, is a sign that we have inefficient burning. Um, we measure for carbon monoxide. We don't 
generally measure for hydrogen gas. Um, they do kind of go hand in hand. Though, if you have carbon monoxide, you probably have uh, hydrogen gas as well. Uh, and of course, the big problem here, if we have these as our products, if these gases ignite within the stack, they could possibly cause uh, cause an explosion. And imagine, uh, you know, a 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 meter stop tall stack that's a few meters in diameter, uh, blowing up like a Bugs Bunny uh, shotgun. Uh, it wouldn't be a good day. So uh, as, as a result of the hazards involved with having this happen, uh, we have the industry standard, which is measuring for oxygen and carbon monoxide. And we'll talk about measuring oxygen and carbon monoxide, or we have already actually in analyzers uh, in the previous ILMs. So moving on to these measurements, uh, carbon monoxide measurement, uh, again, tells us how well we are mixed. If we have high carbon monoxide, it tells us that we need more air. Um, there's always going to be some carbon monoxide, so our goal, again, the magic number is about 200 ppms as the indicator of a good burn. If we have more than that, that's probably not very good. Uh, this works hand in hand with the oxygen reading. Um, they kind of rely on each other, and you'll, you'll discover as you read through the ILM uh, what they're talking about in, in this statement here that I have on the slide. Uh, that says this backs up the oxygen reading, which may be affected by air leaking into the stack after the burner. So measurement location uh, does come into play a little bit and one of the things that's particular about burner systems or furnaces or whatever it happens to be is they're not always 100% uh, tight. Uh, lots of uh, furnaces and things like that have inspection ports and doors and things like that on them and they're big flanged metal uh, structures so they're not necessarily 100% tight uh, which means that it, they could in theory because lots of them work uh, under under a vacuum, they could, in theory, draw in extra oxygen that could screw up our measurements. So that's why we kind of work with CO and oxygen as a side-by-side -side, uh, measurement of our combustion uh, efficiency, which is where we're kind of going with this. So combustion efficiency, uh, we'll talk about that here. This is a goal, is trying to make sure that we get the maximum amount of heating value of the fuel that we're, uh, that we're burning. Uh, without creating a hazardous environment or or any kind of pollution. So um, combustion efficiency by definition is the effectiveness of a combustion system to convert the fuel into heat energy. And the key point is making it available to the process. Uh, we want all the fuel that we burn to provide the heat for what we need it to. We don't want to be wasting it. Uh, another definition here, heating value of the fuel. This changes uh, between different fuels and there's a couple examples in the ILM. Uh, methane and propane, for example, are fairly popular ones that uh, you'll see. Uh, and basically, the heating value of the fuel is a measurement of the amount of heat that one unit of fuel, whether it's a joule per kilogram or a joule per meter uh, cube, is the amount of heat that a particular fuel uh, will produce. And there's a couple of uh, little examples in there that'll show you, uh, you know, how much heat you can get out of methane, how much heat you can get out of propane. Uh, exit gas heat loss. Uh, another important term for us, these are the hot gases that leave the furnace, which carry away heat that was actually intended uh, for the process. So exit gas heat loss is a, is a bad thing. Overall combustion efficiency is a net result of the available heating value or the potential of the fuel that we uh, are providing uh, minus, all, minus all the different kinds of losses. So there's exit gas heat loss and there's a couple of other ones that uh, are out there, but we're not really that particularly concerned about them. But we are uh, trying to understand the, the uh, parameters that are involved uh, in trying to get maximum combustion efficiency. Okay, so how do we measure uh, combustion efficiency? There's a few different uh, a few different calculations in here. We don't get into a whole bunch of calculations in this ILM, um, but they are here uh, for us to review uh, kind of theoretically so that we understand what's going into a heating process uh, and the relationship between that and what's coming out of the heating process. So a number of formulas here uh, present combustion efficiency can be represented by, uh, represented by the heat available uh, to the process divided by the heating value. So what are we putting in and how much is it getting used up by the process? So that's one measure. Uh, another measure uh, is 100% um, of our available heating energy 
minus the percent total heat loss. And this is the uh, simplest version, and this is kind of the one that we're worried or we're most concerned with. Uh, and then the other calculation here is how do you calculate total heat loss? Total heat loss is uh, that number of how much heat we're losing. It's a measure of temperature going up the stack minus the potential heating value that we could have got out of the specific fuel that we're using uh, converted into a percentage with the, with the number 100. So a lot of different ways that we can measure uh, combustion efficiency. But again, the idea here is that we want to get uh, maximum use of our fuel heating value that's provided by the fuel uh, and the least amount of heat uh, being lost. Okay, we can measure uh, combustion efficiency with something called efficiency tables. This is not something that you're going to have to do, um, but you do have to be aware of the existence of these tables. Uh, and these tables are used to determine the combustion efficiency from some things that we know. Uh, these things would include the type of fuel, uh, the increase in exit gas temperature. So again, measuring the exit gas temperature can tell us a lot about what's going on uh, in the combustion. If we have the right amount of air and fuel, we're going to get a certain temperature. If we have too much air in there, um, it's going to raise or lower the exit gas temperature. And we can use that in uh, diagnosing our efficiency with one of these efficiency tables. Uh, we also measure the percent excess oxygen in air and the amount of carbon monoxide in the fuel gas. So if we know uh, these numbers through uh, measurement uh, devices that we have installed, we can use combustion efficiency tables in order to determine how efficient our process actually is. Uh, two types of tables are the percent loss tables and the direct combustion efficiency tables. Um, the percent loss tables have more available variables and we'll just show you one real quick. Uh, for fun. Uh, and here's where you see we have a relationship uh, between the percentage of excess oxygen and the amount of combustibles in the, in the flue gas. So uh, really the thing that you're looking at here is um, where do we where do we end up getting our our uh, most most efficiency here? So for example, at, uh, at the given temperature of 800 degrees Celsius here, 4% uh, oxygen and 0.5 uh, percent combustibles has an efficiency of about 60, uh, 69.9. I don't know where that number is, but it's somewhere in this table uh, way over here. It tells us that this is our, our kind of our nice operating range. Again, this is not an exercise that we'll typically do as tradespeople, but this is uh, how they determine if things are working properly. So there's probably somebody looking at one of these charts uh, somewhere. And they're telling you that we got some problems, so you're going to have to go out and uh, figure out why we have these problems. So now let's look at the effect of excess air and its effect on combustion efficiency, because we know we have to have uh, a certain minimum amount of air, uh, which we call stoichiometric, but that's not good enough. So we have to have a little bit of excess air. And we said it's 1% um, oxygen or 5% excess air. So why, why do we have to do that? And what are the consequences? Are they all good or is there some bad? Um, so there are two major effects of excess air on combustion efficiency. The first one is heat loss uh, due to com incomplete combustion. Uh, and this is called CO heat loss. This is a result of not having uh, enough excess air. The second problem is heat that excess air carries away from the process as it goes up the stack. And this is an effect of having too much excess air. So maximum combustion efficiency is going to occur when the amount of air is just right. It'll use the least, uh, it'll have the least excess possible. Uh, this will minimize CO loss and also heat that's carried away by excess oxygen. So if you were to uh, look in here, you see where we get our fuel uh, and our oxygen coming across at an ideal ratio. At, at this point right here, we have the lowest amount of carbon uh, monoxide uh, being produced. And we have also at that point, uh, the highest efficiency. And you'll see that it occurs somewhere uh, on the right hand side of the stoichiometric line, uh, which indicates that we do have in fact, a little bit of excess air over here that uh, is required in order for us to get the maximum efficiency of the lowest amount of CO out of our um, fire machine. Target values again, 
lifestyle. We're aiming for 1% excess oxygen or 5% excess air and no more really than 200 ppms of CO being our target value. So you see that the range here is uh, in this table anyway, kind of somewhere between 100 and 300 ppms of carbon monoxide and a half a percent to a little over uh, 2% of excess oxygen in this case. But you'll see the interception line here happens at under 200 ppms CO and about 1% excess oxygen. So that's why we have these values here. All right, what is the, aside from the economic uh, considerations here for complete combustion, we wanna get the most value from our fuel. Um, there's also pollution that comes into play here. So the two things that we're trying to achieve by ensuring that we have proper combustion efficiency, uh, first and foremost, uh, for the company anyway, is gonna be energy conservation. Uh, and then uh, the second variable, and not necessarily in that order, but pollution uh, is the second major concern. So proper combustion efficiency uh, allows us to use the minimum, minimal amount of fossil fuel uh, and the resulting uh, benefits of that, of course, is that if we if we burn an efficiency, it'll last a lot longer. Um, and we know that the clock is running out on carbon-based fuels as we sit here today anyway. Uh, emissions from all burners of all types, of course, uh, can have the potential uh, of putting harmful chemicals and particles uh, which pollute our environment. And we, of course, don't want that. Uh, 20 years ago, the big concern was acid rain. Um, Acid rain is, is a result of products of combustion, such as sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, and oxides, uh, different oxides of nitrogen. Um, we've kind of moved away from the big buzz involved with uh, acid rain now to the big problems involved with uh, carbon capture and, and just general hydrocarbon burning. Um, we haven't really spoke about SO2 and NO2 and all this kind of stuff when we look at the different chemical formulas. Um, and I'll just throw this in here right now, looking at the, the chemical formulas that we've looked at in the beginning of this lecture, the CH4 plus O2 uh, yielding CO2 and H2O. Um, again, theoretical, uh, the reality of it is, is when we pull methane out of the ground, it's not pure methane. Uh, even when we run it through, um, run it through a, uh, a treating process, we still end up with some other things that are naturally occurring, things like sulfur, uh, sulf sour gas, for example, uh, we know is sour because it has a lot of sulfur in it. Uh, amines and, and nitrogens uh, are also in the raw product. So we don't really look at that in the context of this course, um, but it is important to know that they are in there as well. There's no such thing as, you know, 100% pure. 100% uh, near pure methane. So there are byproducts and we have to be concerned with these byproducts. Okay, so in terms of polluters, um, in terms of polluters, of course, we have different types of hydrocarbons. Uh, and we're getting real close to the end of the presentation here. Um, common hydrocarbons that we're burning today, uh, coal, this is the worst one by far. Uh, coal is a solid fuel. Uh, it ends up with all kinds of bad things coming out here. You see oxides of nitrogen, carbon dioxide, uh, different levels of just pure straight carbon, which we see as soot, uh, ammonia, uh, dust particles, uh, hydrochloric, uh, hydrochloric acid and vapor comes out of there. So coal is, coal is very bad. Um, it's, it's the worst in terms of it all, uh, all pollution. Uh, followed by the second one, fuel oil, which we call it, commonly referred to as diesel. Uh, it's a little bit cleaner. And then natural gas um, is, of course, the cleanest hydrocarbon that we can burn. And of course, with all the buzz about carbon capture and carbon dioxide and Alberta's dirty oil and all this kind of stuff, um, the whole idea of trying to meet these uh, international panel on climate change goals for reducing our carbon emissions and stuff like that is all fine and well, but the reality of it is that uh, first world, first world countries, uh, North American countries, European countries, developed nations, and things like that, we're all burning uh, mostly natural gas at this point in time. Whereas lots of the third world countries, uh, which constitute a majority of the Earth's population, are still burning coal. Uh, and really, the only thing that 
in my personal opinion, that we can do, or the most effective thing that we can do as an oil producing uh, province is get our natural gas um, to these countries that are burning coal. If we can convert all the coal burning countries into natural gas, that by itself is going to, uh, of course, increase our uh, carbon contribution to the world. But overall, it's going to bring carbon uh, production down uh, a lot. And you'll see some things on the news these days that, that kind of talk about that. Yeah, Alberta produces lots of uh, hydrocarbons. Um, and in order for us to, to share with the rest of the world, our numbers are going to have to go up. But the idea is that we get a net reduction overall uh, if, you're, if you're worried about carbon and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so how do we get rid of uh, some of this pollution? So there are lots of different things that we can do uh, process wise, uh, low oxides of nitrogen burners, uh, reducing uh, the flame temperature produces less pollution, uh, fuels with less sulfur and nitrogen. And those of you guys who've got the big diesel trucks that are like to roll coal, uh, have probably noticed that in the last few years you roll up to the pumps and you can buy ultra low sulfur diesel. Uh, that's one of the uh, considerations that they're uh, taking into account uh, the amount of pollution produced. Uh, better monitoring and reporting, of course, and this is where we come in, making sure that our, our uh, CO measurements and our oxygen measurements and the tuning of our combustion parameters are as good as they can be so that we're running at maximum efficiency uh, and minimum pollution. And then uh, last but not least, dealing with some of the harmful byproducts before it going out uh, to the stack. And there's a little section in the ILM that talks uh, kind of more specifically about coal burning and uh, the processes that you can uh, you can put in between the burner and the stack in order to get rid of uh, some of the harmful pollutants. And to put it on a smaller scale, uh, think of your catalytic converter uh, in your vehicle. And its purpose is to get rid of anything that uh, made it through the engine without getting burnt uh, and converting into something less harmful before it leaves your tailpipe. So it's the same idea on a smaller scale as it is on a large uh, industrial scale. So that's it for uh, this presentation uh, on combustion uh, and, and gas analyzers. We will talk more about this uh, in, in measurement as well and also in chemistry as we move forward here. Um, but again, a, a nice little spin-off industry for instrumentation of uh, combustion uh, optimization is, is something that you're interested in. So that is the end uh, of gas analyzers part C and actually all of the gas analyzers section. So I believe you guys are set up for uh, an exam. Yeah, you are. There's an exam after this. So happy studying. <laughs>